So hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming out on what was hopefully a late, but not too late, evening last night. Uh, we were, we, this was originally supposed to be on election day, and we were all, very, we were all fretting about that. So, um, My name is AJ Ehrenstein. I'm the assistant director for master's program engagement in graduate student affairs here at the University of Chicago. And I'm also a 2010 alum of the Master of Arts program in Humanities. Uh, so I wanted to say thanks to Kate Zambrino for being here. Kate Zambrino is a 2002 alum of the Master of Arts program in Humanities, math. She's published two novels and a recent genre-bending work of critical memoir, biography, narrative, and a lot of other things uh, called Heroines. Uh, we just learned, I think a couple of weeks ago, that her anti-memoir entitled The Book of Mutter will be published by Counterpath in 2014. Uh, and we'll keep buying all of these beautiful books as long as you keep writing them, um, putting them in Math Central, which we're excited about. Kate's work has earned her a reputation for pressing on boundaries between genres and bending the conventions that govern our expectations of forms for the novel, for poetry, and for criticism. Her inventive prose is shot through with humor, incisiveness, and lyricism. Uh, here's one of my favorite lines from O oh Fallen Angel, which was her debut novel. Quote, Maggie is broken. Maggie is having a breakdown. Maggie is having a psychic break, and it ain't to Bermuda. <laughs> so for me, here it seems like she's asking if, if brokenness is a state of being. Is broken an adjective we can confidently use to describe someone? Do we break? Or is a breakdown something that happens to a person gradually or in an instant? In a review of Kate's second novel, Green Girl, Vanity Fair's Elisa Chappelle wrote, the skill with which Zambrino inhabits the emptiness of her all too recognizable self-obsessed heroine clinging to her persona as it turns to dust in her hands is remarkable. And the book also drove conversations about what the novel should be doing when it comes to experimentation. Here's Kate on reading reviews of Green Girl in an interview with Edith Zimmerman of the, of the Hairpin, which is a great blog that you all should read. Uh, Kate says, I've had to think about how to get a thicker skin as a writer. I still need to figure it out. I think part of being a writer for me is having a thinner skin, to be receptive, aware, sensitive. But I need to stop fucking Googling myself. <laughs> which I think is awesome, and we all need to stop Googling ourselves. <laughs> uh, and finally, last month, month, Kate published Heroines, which I've spent some time reading this week, and which uh, kind of took my breath away a couple of times in the, the passages that I read. The project of Heroines grew out of her long-running blog, Francis Farmer is My Sister, but the vast majority of the content of the book has not appeared before. The book is part memoir, part critical engagement, part revisionist narrative about the wives of great modernists who, of course, turn out to be not such great guys themselves. And throughout, Kate's ability to inhabit different modes and voices is on full view. The rigor of her engagement with difficult theory, she cites everyone from Deleuze to Eliot to Wolf to Sixu to the DSM-4, combined with deeply personal reflections on her own identity as a writer and as a woman, make that theory feel vital for ordinary life. Kate lives in North Carolina with her partner, John. Uh, and about her move, she writes in Heroines, quote, I have exited the Midwestern and am now entering the Southern Gothic. <laughs> but we're very glad to have her back here at U Chicago, where she, we hope that she always feels like she has a home. That was such a lovely introduction, AJ. That was great. It's such a pleasure being back here at University of Chicago. Thank you to AJ and Math for inviting me, as well as to Creative Writing and to everyone that helped coordinate this reading. My year here at U of C in the Math program was a period of wild intellectual and emotional engagement. I took seminars in critical theory and performance studies. All of, all of this, I think, was crucial in my early apprenticeship as a writer, for me more than any potential craft class. One memorable seminar I took was on the fetish, going through Marx, Bataille, Freud, feminist film theory. I mean, what is writing except circling around a fetish? I'm going to be reading today from my critical memoir, Heroines. 
About eight years ago, two years out of the program, I began inhaling the work of modernist women writers and then their biographies. It began when my partner John and I lived in London in the first year of our marriage. I worked at Foyle's bookshop and read Annika Van, Jane Bowles, Jean Rees for the first time. And then this obsession continued upon moving back to Chicago where I began reading the biographies of the famous wives of modernism, Zelda Fitzgerald, Vivian Elliott, also the biographies of their husbands. It was a complete possession and obsession which existed in those beginning years in constant journaling. Possessed like Sylvia Plath's die book, the soul of a former suicide, who wants to try and unravel and figure out the modernist memory project to see how these women were written were erased. I'm going to read you the opening myth of Sybil. She was supposed to fuck a god high up on his mountaintop, but she refused. She wouldn't listen to Apollo's reasoning. So he cursed her, a life sentence. He said, sure, you can live forever, as many grains of sand in your hand, but that young, lovely body will be gone. You will wrinkle up into nothingness. Who will love you now? Who will listen? Eventually her body was kept in a jar and then there was only her voice left, only her voice left, and then not really her voice at all. The rhythm of my mad woman's lives, a long scream followed by absolute silence. At the beginning, I think of endings. The mad wives of modernism who died in the asylum, locked away, rendered safe, forgotten, erased, or rewritten. Vivian Elliott, whose alter ego in her writing was Sibylla, the voice in the jar that begins her husband's poem, The Wasteland. Zelda Fitzgerald, the tarnished golden girl of her husband's legend, who burned to death in an asylum fire in Asheville, North Carolina. All that remained to identify her, a single shard slipper. Jane Bowles stroked out, later buried in an unmarked grave in Miyaga, Spain, while her husband, Paul, never stopped writing. Sitting at the mouth of my cave, I string together fragments on paper, my scraps scattering to the wind if unread. Out of this narrative will emerge a chalk outline. It is the body of a woman. These fragments I have shored against my ruins. For years and years, I carried these notebooks around with me. I had hundreds of pages of notes, these fragments that consisted of biographical anecdotes, diary passages, critical rants, agitations, scenes of my partnership that viewed from the outside was a marriage, meditations on this new wifedom. I originally framed the work, which became most of part one of heroines, as a fictional notebook called Mad Wife, an anonymous woman with a husband named John, cue the yellow wallpaper reference, who feels literally like she's possessed with the mistresses and mad women of modernism, them being her eternal reference point. Heroin flashes back to London and Chicago the early years of our marriage while being set in Akron, Ohio in part one, where we moved so John could take a post as a rare books librarian. The archive and who keeps it and who is remembered is a recurring theme in the book. Heroines is an extremely referential text it lives on and builds and breathes through so many other literary works. And in the first half of part one, I'm deliberately playing with not only the yellow wallpaper, but also the game of chess section of Eliot's The Wasteland. And I'm going to read you a section dealing with that messy marital feud part of the poem. Do you know that part of the poem? My nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. So, um, so the, the section I'm going to read from you it involves on one level a reading of that section juxtaposed against an interrogation of Eliot's theories of literature. And this I collaged against a fragmented biography of the real life couple while interweaving and mirroring my own personal narrative, poeticizing the almost mythic marital feud, looking at masculine rhetoric as a form of violence. I distrust the feminine in literature, T.S. Eliot once opined a fear of the feminine in writing, of the hysterical, the emotional, the violent, much as we fear women's rage and tears. In Eliot's essay on Hamlet, in which he coins the phrase, objective correlative, he writes, Hamlet the man is dominated by an emotion which is inexpressible because it is an excess of the facts as they appear. His theories of depersonalization form the foundation of the theoretical school called New Criticism, still the fundamental ideology governing how we read and talk about writing. One cannot portray emotions in excess, in literature or in life. 
This is a judgment not only of a work of literature, but also of propriety, how one should behave. One must discipline one's text, oneself. He do the police in different voices, the original title of The Wasteland. Why is Hamlet's grief excessive? Let's see. His father was murdered. His mother is fucking his uncle. It's cold in Denmark. Maybe that's enough for a bad mood. It's cold in Denmark. But Hamlet is still allowed to be overcome by despair, however excessive, because it is still read as existential. He is the hero of the story. It's Ophelia who wails and moans and drowns in an inch of water. But Eliot doesn't ask about her objective correlative. If Hamlet is seen as overwrought to T.S. Eliot, what does he think of Ophelia's melancholic swoons? He who conjures up her dramatic good night speech in the wasteland. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night, good night. Nothing is objective to Ophelia. It is all so subjective. She takes things so personally. Viv in a letter to Tom's brother, and be personal. You must be personal or else it's no good. He is the guardian of the correct at home and in literature of what is kept out, emotions, excess. In Flaubert's novel, Madame Bovary, Charles moves himself and his wife to a new town because Emma has begun to display symptoms of melancholy. But we are not supposed to read Emma as an existential heroine. Flaubert depicts her misery as frivolous and poisoned by schoolgirl fantasies of never being able to be happy with anything real, like her doting if dull husband. But maybe Emma is moody because she feels trapped. She's just left her father's home, the boring farm, and now she's stuck in some backwater town. An alienation of the self to go from daughter to wife and expect freedom in that movement. Yet marriage was considered a cure for hysteria. Not enough has been made of the existential alienation that came for these women in that first year of marriage. Both Virginia Woolf and Viv experienced this debilitating depression. The first years of Vir of Virginia's marriage beset by arguments, extended periods of alienation, her suicide attempt the second year. They were expected to leave the house they grew up in, change their names, and be suddenly not their own sovereign, but a wife of. Vivian hated when she was left alone. Jane, too, could not stand to be alone. Zelda would grow enraged as Scott would work and ignore her. She had reverted to infantile terrors of loneliness, writes one of Eliot's biographers of Vivian. I read these biographies of the great men, their pathologizing, constructing language, and hone my fury like listening to right-wing talk radio. In Greek tragedy, Penelope is the wife who resigns herself to waiting. Clytemnestra is the wife who waits and grows murderous. A woman's voice in quotations. My nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. Yes, and wonderful, wonderful, wrote Viv times two on the typescript of The Wasteland, which she helped edit, supplied lines for, even wrote another clever passage herself excised by Ezra Pound, but that appeared later under a pseudonym in their little magazine, The Criterion. Photography, Ezra scrawled next to these lines a too true snapshot of an unhappy marriage. The A Game of Chess section conjures up a trapped mutual miserabilism, a tiny cramped domestic space, the murder of a small room. He punishes her with silence, it riles her up more. He did not see that Elliot, in starving Vivian of affection, was unwittingly contributing to her hysteria. She tries to get him to talk to her, her shrill, nervous voice. What are you thinking of? What thinking? What? our bickering, a constant pattern, rhythm, in our domestic quotidian. I never know what you are thinking, think. I who insist on narrativizing everything and giving voice to a constant monologue. He who often prefers silence, introspection. She is battering around the room, a zinging ball, wanting to escape. He answers in monotone. Her persistent interrogations, which threaten to evict all sense from her brain. She pushes him to the edge threatens to rush out on the street raving, makes him remember and resurrect personal traumas. The section has the ascetic of shell shock, the masculine term for hysteria, soldiers coming home from World War I and jumping out of windows, like Septimus Smith and Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. The great men's marriages were their wars. They who didn't actually make the great war, Elliot unfit because of his hernia, Fitzgerald who enlisted but never actually saw the front lines, much to his disappointment. 
a return to these old roles that we play that we didn't even originate, all the ghosts of the past, ghosts that aren't even our ghosts. When, a day here, or maybe a day in Chicago, at the odds and ends of everything today, slamming up against his marble remove, I pick fights, I pick at him, we are monkeys in a cage. In the cage, the original title of the game of chess section of the wasteland, the suitcase pulled to the center of the room like the feuding Fitzgerald's infamous rose. Zelda would wildly flirt with other men, the rumored affair with the aviator, Scott had his actresses, a marriage so soon in ruins, Scott began to drink, Zelda began to implode, photos where the strains are showing, in photographs, their smiles are tight. Zelda is tense, ready to strike. Simone D.B. writing of Frida and D.H. Lawrence's numerous and physical fights. Married life had become for them a series of scenes repeated over and over in which neither of them would give in, turning the least quarrel into a titanic duel between man and woman. It does feel like a war with him at these times, a grudge match stripped of memory, naked. When I read Vivian's biography, I cast John as the villain in my current misery. I'm more aware than ever how I become infected by his containment, his repression, his almost paranoid desire for privacy. Fights fueled by feelings of entrapment, a fervent, feral desire to escape. Enforced domesticity brought on black moods. One more part to this section. They were always moving, 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 Tom and Viv, the unhappy couple. Elliot's Soho bachelor lodgings at 35 Greek Street wouldn't do. And so began their game of musical chairs. Vivian loved to dance to the phonograph. Bertrand Russell paid for her lessons. Zelda had the same ballet teacher as Lucia Joyce. She would bring Madame Agorova white flowers and glasses. Always searching, frantic to get out of London to a country cottage, somewhere, can you please help? They send furious SOSs to their rich friends. Then later, the tourism of sanatoriums and seaside convalescence. In their years together, Tom plunged into a suicidal depression. Each of them struggled with terrible influenza. Corals and migraines punctuated their lives. What was he trying to escape from? His new bride, most likely. It is terrible to be alone with another person, Eliot writes, a line later excised from the wasteland. In London, we moved around wildly, three times in nine months. All the modernist couples moved so much. Catherine Mansfield and John Middleton Murray moved 12 times in three years. June and Henry Miller, nomadic in New York. Jean Rees and whatever husband she had at the time. The Fitzgeralds, the Eliots, the Bulls, of course, a whirlwind. But how do you feel steady when your bottom is always slipping out from under you? So restless, yes, a generation lost. Rooms after rooms, shabby flats, like a Jean Rees novel. A sort of marital aviary, Vivian's hawk nose, Tom's hawk eyes. They stayed at Birdie's near the British Museum, a convenient menage a trois, always French, menage a trois, maladie à deux. Elliot slept in the hall in a chair, a third to provide relief from themselves. Maybe Vivian thought, why not? If I cannot be a great man, I will fuck one. Then a cramped, noisy flat near Paddington Station, 18 Crawford Mansions, Crawford Street, Marleybone. We too lived near Paddington Station, all the wonders of W2, the first in a series of cramped rooms, the bed that folded out from the closet, the tiny school kit desk, we went to Woolworths and bought cutlery, plates, two white teacups, our married life in miniature, at night a pounding on the other side of the door, the constant tempo of the humping Spaniards. Then a large room above a curry restaurant on Brick Lane in the East End, past crowds of Jack the Ripper tours, near where Zelda donned men's clothes for a nighttime tour of the docks. Our neighborhood was known as Dodgy. The callers luring passers-by into their curry houses, drunken American tourists, stag parties. Sometimes a drunken fight would break out into the streets and we would watch by the windows as the bobbies arrived. Hurry up, please, it's time. The barking refrain from the wasteland. The Elliots lived across from a pub at their first flat on Crawford Street. Tom complained about the actresses playing the phonograph. 
They entertained each other with cruel caricatures of their beastly neighbors. Vivian would mimic their cockney accents. Well, you see, sir, it's the artistic temperament. We ordinary folks must learn to make allowances for artists. They're not the same as us, said their landlord, unironically. The noise on Brick Lane was fragmenting, obscene. We had to leave. Their move to a more spacious abode at Nine Clarence Gate Gardens, a large Victorian building close to Regent's Park. It was where they stayed unhappily the rest of their marriage, editing the Criterion, where she later lived alone, his photographs on the wall. Our room number three was also close to Regent's Park, had the same dark carpeted staircases and jangling lifts. Another institutional tomb a card table for a dining table, the bed actually two mattresses piled on top of each other. They're going to knock the whole building down, you know. An elderly woman wanders into our apartment as we're moving in. She is Ruth Gordon and Rosemary's baby. I am spooked Mia. John is at the British Library finishing his thesis. In 1918, Viv writes in a letter that Life is so feverish and yet so dreary at the same time, and one is always waiting, waiting for something generally waiting for some particular strain to be over. One thinks, when this is over, I will write. Vivian always frantically looking for a place outside of London, a nice cottage perhaps, looking to escape the trauma of the Blitz, never being able to escape the trauma of life itself, of her marriage, a melodrama played out on her body. Then the terrorist attacks of 7-7, the evacuation of our local tube station where a bomb was supposed to go off. We watched the hysteria on the TV at the nearby dormitory for international students. A framed photograph of the captain, as Elliot liked to be called, when he moved to his secret lodgings on Charing Cross Road, hangs near the snack station. Snack station. The bloated later Elliot, soon onto wife number two, daughter figure, secretary. Viv also was his secretary. There she is in their Paddington flat with her Corona typewriter. She is posed in profile, hands on hips. We lay on our lumpy bed and hold each other, feeling panicked against the stoic Englishness around us, a badge of pride since the Blitz and the IRA, a sort of emotional imperialism that Viv also experienced. Only the foreigners seemed completely freaked out. So in the work, I'm quite interested in how these wives were written and constructed by the psychiatric attitudes of the time and the ways their husbands wrote them, the way the biographies wrote them. And something I ask in Heroines is who controls these narratives? Who has historically written the narrative about how someone should behave, the narratives of psychiatry, about how someone should write, the narratives of literature? And I'll just read you a small section and then a longer section. Could it be anxiety? In Chicago, soon after returning from London, I began seeing a French doctor, Dr. Bruno. I chose him solely because he is French. It made it easier to select a doctor from the enormous HMO list provided by the insurance company. I thought a French doctor would be more willing to see me somehow. I was obviously wrong. Dr. Bruno is short and stubby. I tell him, I am a writer. Must stop telling people this. I write too, he says. Everyone is working on a novel. My doctor is working on a novel. A fellow adjunct, a silver-haired art historian, is working on a novel about a silver-haired art historian, spy. <laughs> Could it be anxiety, my French doctor muses in his French way. I call him this week to complain of fatigue, swollen glands. I don't know. It could be, I say. I am desperate. It has been well documented that women are diagnosed more because they are trained to be help seekers. SOS, save me from myself. He prescribed Xanax, little peach pills. My nerves are bad tonight, yes, bad. Diagnosed with nerves with old-fashioned neurasthenia. A recent headline trumpeting from the science page of the New York Times. Is hysteria real? Brain images say yes. Good to know. Should I be worried about side effects? He waves his hand disparagingly. After weeks on the benzos, I wean myself off, and the withdrawal is terrible. The shakes, the paranoia, the panic attacks. Vivian was 16 when her mother turned to the family doctor to control her. Doses of bromides for hysterics. Hoffman's anodyne dissolved in ether. 
Her breath always stank of it, of empiric vibe, along with the white makeup to cover up the spots caused by the bromides. And so the process of tranquilizing Vivian began. For Viv and Zelda, chloral hydrate, ovarian extracts, dried th thyroid gland powders. Zelda was injected with her own blood and a serum made from the blood of a mentally stable person. Also, belladonna, luminal, morphine, stromium, digitalis, hydrotherapy, purges, wet packs, insulin therapy, used for female patients, realigned behavior, also ECT, coma therapy, Virginia, teeth pulling, veronal, adalin, chlorohydrate, peraldehyde, potassium, bromide, digitalis. Dr. Bruno relaxes. He leans back in his chair. Tell me, do you enjoy the novels of Julian Barnes? So I begin the movement of the book in a sort of voluptuous isolation in communion with my madwives. And then I document beginning a blog, which I started about three years ago. And what happened was I'd been working on this novel, Madwife, for a while, some of which, which became the book. But I also went back and I was rereading the male modernist gods like Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer or Bataille's Blue of Noon, also pre-modernists like Madame Bovary, and I was loving the ecstasy of these works but also feeling conflicted with how the female character was represented, almost colonized within the text, colonized, colonialized, colonized within the text, and also then, you know, really getting to the material lives lived, how the muse or mistress figures were rewritten. So I began to really be interested in men who fetishized and channeled the feminine or hysterical in their texts while disciplining and punishing the women in their lives, which I see as a big movement of a lot of modernism a reverse meaning of femme fatale, like Scott with Zelda, Flaubert with Louise Collet, June Miller, who both Henry and Anais Nin drew from, or Colette Pignot, posthumously renamed Lore by Bataille, who he made into the character Dirty and Blue of Moon, who published fragments of her writing after her death, he drew on her as his living embodiment of his philosophy. So I'm gonna read you a section which deals somewhat with my fascination with the lost surrealist girls like Milk Carton heroines, and this fascination with surrealism began actually here at UFC. I took a seminar on Borges and surrealism. Uh, and I, my underlinings of Breton's Nadia reflected a still unformed feminist foment. I was just underlined the whole thing. I remember saying, it's so sexist. Like that was my very astute criticism. But this frustration of the girl trapped as a character, not as an author, which I would say has probably continued in most of my writing. And in that seminar, actually, I took a passing grade because I, lab I didn't turn in the final essay. I was like, oh, whatever. But I, I labeled blocked forever on it. It was on Borges, Belle de Jour, and Deleuze on masochism. You know, I never wrote that essay, but then years later, I wrote Green Girl, which has a very Catherine Deneuve-like anti-heroine, Ruth, who's also obsessed with Catherine Deneuve, another very referential text. I guess if Heroines is an essay that is really a novel, Green Girl is really a novel that is an essay. My attempt at a philosophy of the girl and her ambivalent state. This is a main concern in Heroines, especially part two, looking at the way Zelda was censored from writing her own material as a main case study. When she wrote this novel, Save Me the Waltz, all the madness stuff had to be taken out because Fitzgerald was um, writing Tender is the Night, which was about her breakdown. She was prohibited from writing the autobiographical in the future. And this builds into an examination how the autobiographical, the diaristic, is still viewed as this indulgent, narcissistic form, looking at even second wave critiques of Anais Nin and Jean Rees, especially when girls write it. So that's a big concern in the work. And asking whether these ideas, a taboo against writing the excessive female first person, prohibit the girl from her writing, asking what else prohibits her, asking what it means to be a character, how she can write herself, how ideas of genius and the canon can be oppressive. And Heroines ends with a meditation on blogging in the contemporary, um, looking at the wild, unmediated spaces on the internet. And I mean, something that happens with the book is I, I document beginning to form another invisible community of mostly women writers, but also how the blog served as a way for me to essay and to write against the dominant narrative for myself in the margins. And this is, I tried to pick Chicago sections. So I'm gonna read this um, fun section, which, you know, my partner is a rare books librarian, and my partner is usually here at readings, um, 
but you know he was definitely a first reader and strong supporter of the work, even though I definitely um, write at times about the poison of the gender binary within the work. But this, the fact that he was a special collections librarian, a rare books librarian, is kind of a through line throughout as I reflect on archives. On a trip home to Chicago, I go to the Library of the Art Institute, my special collections partner in tow, to look at the Hans Bellmer books housed in the Mary Reynolds collection as I want to get closer to Una Kazern, whose gorgeous novel, Screen Memory, Dark Spring, I had just read. They didn't have any of her materials, unsurprisingly. Mary Reynolds was Duchamp's mistress, an ingenious bookbinder who also became close to the Baroness Elsa and helped her out at a time when almost everyone else had ostracized her. By then, Duchamp had dumped Mary to marry an heiress. I always experience a sort of chilly, paternalistic air when in these rare book reading rooms like they are worried your heat could somehow damage the immortal material. The Tweedy Rare Books librarian doesn't want me to touch the books. He voices his skepticism about how much of the vision behind these extraordinarily bound books are Reynolds. He suggests that they are mostly Deschamps design, which he just told Reynolds then to do. Of course he thinks that. I mean, of course he thinks that. But it's also a case of peddling the items require more value being the brainchild of a great man as opposed to his mistress. I write notes in my notebook because I assume I'm supposed to. I write, I am not a scholar. I write also, I do not know French or German. I also write down for some reason what I am wearing. Soft gray jacket with a high collar that is almost backless, black cloche hat, soft stretchy black pants tucked into black boots, old, old dark gray cardigan which has permanent pit stains. All my beautiful pieces I keep like in a museum because I don't want them ruined somehow by the stink or casualness of my body. I leaf through old issues of Minotaur, the only female presence, the gorgeous photos of Lee Miller and other surrealist models, and Belmer's mechanical dolls. I'm realizing these muses of modernism were often objectified twice over through literature and often through psychiatry, both reducing them to their body. She is the doll, Hans Bellmer said when meeting Una Kazern, marveling at her resemblance to his poupées. Later, his photo of her naked, bound torso on the cover of a surrealist journal with the caption, keep in a cool place. The meaning is clear. She is a piece of meat. During the time I began reading the biographies of the Madwives, stewing in my obsessions, feeling eerily like I was performing their lives, I write a letter to Poetry Magazine about a review of Dejuna Barnes's posthumous poetry collection. Although I had previously written theater and book reviews, I think of this letter as one of my first acts of criticism, which for me always originates in feeling, in an angry protectiveness, especially towards my beloved women. The review begins by using Gertrude Stein's condescending compliment of Barnes, the description of her lovely ankles, and continues to characterize Dejuna Barnes as an it girl of the left bank, not Barnes the girl and genius, but a mere pretty socialite flitting around the more serious modernist writers. The reviewer also theorized that Eliot must have exposed her to John Donne and the rest of the metaphysical poets that he saw as inspiring her poetry. These are all small, slight dismissals, but the snarky details chosen add up to a dismissal of the work by focusing on Dejuna Barnes' looks, how others saw her, refusing to regard her as anything more than a dilettante, a novelty. This review was not the fetting or canonizing of a genius, but the petting of a girl lucky to be in the periphery. They published my heating letter valorizing Nightwood as one of the most important masterpieces of modernism and taking issue with the reviewer's characterization of her as a minor, flashy accessory to some more significant scene, noting that Samuel Beckett regularly sent her money in her days of poverty later on in the village because he was like others admiring of her genius and that James Joyce let him call her Jim because he regarded her as a peer, not because she was some cute thing. Poetry then allows the reviewer a rebuttal, something along the lines of, I still conclude that Dejuna Barnes is a minor writer. Ephemeral, denied the canon, objectified by her slim ankles. 
I participate in my first internet feud, not my last, when the <laughs> online literary blog HTML Giant publishes a satirical post about Zelda Fitzgerald, written by the pithy punchline bully Jimmy Chen, whose shtick usually involves posting images with inane captions in an attempt to emerge highbrow, low highbrow with hipster irony, a lit version of the do's and don'ts in Vice magazine, the subtext often a disgust with the female body, such as his post pointing out the pronounced nipples of a female literature professor at an Ivy League. The photo is the one used on the back of Milford's biography of the lovely numbed out Zelda posed on a crate with her ballet slippers. Chen, operating out of the most caricatured outline of the Fitzgerald myth, rhapsodizes about Zelda's cute folds of back fat in the photo and quips that he hopes the sheets were comfortable in the asylum. I wish I could quote it. It's been taken down since, along with many of his offending posts. The snarky dismissal, I answer back with vitriol. It becomes heated, ugly, personal. Slurs of a sexual nature slung in the comment section, mostly by a chauvinistic supporter of Chen's. A way to bully, which is to humiliate, to silence, to make a woman smaller whose behavior is seen as outsized. Won't she fucking shut up? This is one of the first times I exhibit rage online in the comment sections and in my blog in those early months. I feel so protective of these women. I summon forth all my fury. Fellow bloggers comment extensively, comforting me, rallying behind me, helping to contextualize my anger. Our blogs serve as legitimizing networks. The rant can be revenge, to get something off our chest about our place in the world, to break the silence, the silencing. Simone de Beauvoir, who writes that the woman is always reduced to the body, regardless of how she situates herself. The photo of her, the one taken in Chicago, a pre la ban. She grew hot after fucking Algren. Pinning her hair, she's standing in front of the mirror naked except for high heels. She is quite a rear on her, everyone said when that French magazine reposted the photos for what would be her 100th birthday. A delight in objectifying the ample rump of one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, as if to say, you are still the second sex. You will still disrobe and discard your intellect at the bedside table. She is so often dismissed, made the punchline, the darling punching bag, later the bag lady joke. They keep her outside. Henry Miller's cunt portraits. The woman is reduced to the cunt, to the body, through which he can achieve his own mystical revelations. The whore acts as a conduit. In those last ecstatic rushes at the end of Tropic of Cancer, jerking off deliriously on literature while we're looking down into this fucked out cunt of a whore, he falls into a volcano, her body the ruins he meditates on. Flaubert's metaphors of fucking for writing, he gets off on himself. The erections of thought are like those of the body. They do not come at will. In guilty, Bataille is drunk, grieving, mad. He surrounds himself with prostitutes like a surrealist Charlie Sheen, <laughs> nameless goddesses who he can fuck to find some sort of release, a temporary death, reaching a mystical ecstasy that is an exit of the self. My true church is a whorehouse, he writes. Dirty, a desirous corpse in blue of noon, trope man jerking off to his mother's corpse. I realized in any case that my attraction to prostitutes was like my attraction to corpses. They lay there and play dead. Yes, yes, the exquisite corpse is female. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.